I'll, I'll let Miriam introduce herself. Hey everybody, this is Miriam, Director of Engagement at C3. Really excited to be learning with y'all today. Feel free to send us some juicy questions. We're excited to have this conversation with you. So this is a bit of an experiment for us in that we uh, made this a half an hour webinar. So we want to like give you some really um, thought provoking uh, things to, to take home with you, but not take too much of your time um, and to, um, uh, to just uh, get you started with that. So just very quickly, a little bit about C3. Um, you may know us. We are the digital agency for do-gooders. We help nonprofits uh, tell powerful stories for social change and move the needle um, on the things that you need to do, whether that's fundraising or advocacy or awareness or recruitment. Um, and uh, we work with uh, a lot of different organizations and um, feel very privileged to do the kind of work that we do helping you achieve your, your missions. So, okay, so I've been thinking for a long time about how I could boil this down about the future of uh, digital success uh, in, in uh, you know, a really clear way so, so i was give just it all the way at the I, beginning yeah so i'm just like why don't we just tell you what it is like what's the answer here so are you ready are you ready for this oh, I'm we're so gonna excited. okay we're yeah all right uh, are you sure you're ready okay here we go the anticipation is killing me yeah <laughs> we're gonna do it um okay all right um, prepare yourselves okay the future of digital can be summed up uh, there you go. Wow. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yes, and you would not uh, be, um, I, I wouldn't blame you if you thought that uh, cats, kittens, puppies uh, were the way to succeed at digital uh, because uh, we see a lot of that um, online. Um, and um, it is what carries a lot of messages. And I know we've worked with uh, charities that work uh, with animal welfare uh, a lot. And uh, I know a lot of folks envy those charities because they have uh, these uh, wonderful images. Um, but there's a lot more going on uh, than, than the cats. And the fact that we are able to share uh, those videos and that, and that really indicates some things about what's possible today. Um, uh, there. But I want to just also say something about velocity. And there's a great quote from William Gibson. If you haven't read Neuromancer, you should definitely do that. It's awesome. Um, uh, but the, and, and it's amazing how some of these science fiction writers have um, really uh, seen incredible things about uh, the present and the future. But this quote is saying the future is here. It's not evenly distributed. We feel that in the nonprofit world all the time, even with basic tools like marketing automation and things that big companies, you know, are using that are just not necessarily accessible to nonprofits. Um, and I think the other piece is just the velocity is increasing. So much faster, the change is happening faster. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But just to see that change, you know, this, I love this image on the left. This is from, and uh, those of you who have seen me speak may have seen this uh, before. Um, this is from waiting for the new Pope to be announced. So the last time that happened was 2013. The time before that was 2005. This is a picture from the same vantage point at the same time in the process. Um, and so in 2005, everybody's waiting and there's one guy in the corner, woman in the corner, on the right, bottom right corner of that photo, you know, with their phone out. Um, but in 2013, pretty much everybody in the crowd went from being uh, a consumer of content to a consumer and a creator of content. And that's just absolutely amazing. Uh, in, in, a, in the world of human history and looking at a timeline of human history, it's a blip. It's not even a blip. It doesn't even register this amount of time and the amount and the change, the basic change to human behavior is so substantial. Um, and so that's the pace that we're on. And all, all of that change in that image is really being powered by the phone. And, and I, you know, I think it's just hilarious that we even call it a phone. Uh, it's a phone and the phone part of it, the voice part of it is the thing we use the least. I never call uh, it. Anyone. Yeah, who, I, nobody, you know, leave a voicemail. Uh, if it's 1991, please leave a voicemail. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're really in a different world today, and, and mobile has driven a lot of that. So just looking at the history of mobile a bit, um, again, amazing. It's only been 10 years since the iPhone uh, existed. And in those 10 years, we just can't imagine the world what it was before uh, hand. And it's been only, you know, uh, about a couple years longer where even YouTube existed and it's hard to imagine a world 
you know, without that. But just how fast something like BlackBerry went from being the thing to being nothing. Uh, and, you know, we're, and Spotify, you know, really streaming music being really new and just completely dominant in, in, in certain ways. Um, and it's really incredible. And just a big milestone at the end there, just a couple of years ago, having a, a feature film being shot on an iPhone. That's absolutely amazing that this consumer device, less than $1,000 being carried around by everyone is capable of that quality is absolutely new uh, in the world. And it's going to create changes for us. So just looking at those changes, um, um, this is a uh, slide from the slide deck of Mary Meeker, who is um, uh, somebody at Kleiner Perkins, which is a big uh, Silicon Valley uh, venture capital fund. Uh, every year she does the state of the internet and it's like a 200 slide presentation. I just pulled out one here to show you or a couple to show you, but just look at the generational change in communication. How do people want to be communicated with? And I think, you know, obviously seeing this 90% with the phone to 64% with the phone to 29% with the phone, with phone. And when it says phone, it doesn't mean smartphone. This means mm -hmm. voice calls is what we're talking about there. And I think what's really interesting about the sort of Gen Y thing here, obviously individuals in these segments aren't all homogenous and people are different and there's you know differences. But the fact that there's not a single dominant thing in that mm. last one, I think is just as important as that it's not the phone anymore. Yeah. So it just, it, it, the, it's a much more complex communication world than it used to be in, in lots of ways. So I think that's, that's just something to take away here. And it also means that you can't communicate the same way with everyone mm -hmm. uh, and that you really have to think about the, your audience and, and your uh, donors and your constituents and how you, you talk to them. And so this, I love this, this was from a Washington Post article about how mobile is actually changing humanity. You know, it's the opposite of the evolutionary thing. We're devolving into our phones. Um, and if you told people that the, the smartphone was a means of control from an alien race, you know, it's, it sounds believable because that's for all, we're all stuck in there. Um, uh, so this, I just want to talk about this because when we talk about what's happening, what's the future of digital and the future of technology right now, um, an answer that would make sense would be messaging uh, and messaging apps have grown dramatically and at, at an incredible pace. So looking at WhatsApp, looking at Facebook messenger, those curves are steeper. Uh, those, those uh, rates of adoption are faster than anything that's come before. And it's massive. So the scale is absolutely massive. So, um, you know, you have a, something that didn't exist before 2010 um, that had a billion people, you know, <laughs> using it. I mean, it's, it's absolutely uh, remarkable and incredible. And that is, um, a, uh, and Facebook is, is hedging because Facebook's saying, well, that's where attention is. So they've created Facebook Messenger. They've sort of forced you, especially on mobile, to use it. You don't have a choice if you, if you want to be on it. Um, and then Facebook bought WhatsApp. So, uh, and Facebook owns Instagram. So Facebook is saying, we're going to um, hedge. WeChat is, um, is a, a Chinese uh, version. So everything, every, uh, every one of these tools that we talk about has its Chinese uh, uh, analog. Um, and we're seeing this growth. And that, and so uh, organizations will say, well, what does that mean for us? You know, uh, messaging is is one on one. It's me talking to you. Well, how can an organization play in that space? And the answer is, we're we're figuring it out. And so we're seeing brands like Hyatt, like many others, starting to say, well, what is this natural language? Uh, thing that we can do using bots if you've heard about bots so automating a set of conversational things where I can talk to this brand I can talk to this organization or I can talk to somebody who appears to be a representative of this organization in a, in a natural language way and I can do this on Facebook Messenger I can be your friend uh, on there and uh, I can start to talk to you and that's just um, that's they're here today and that's going to grow and what that means for us is, and what it means for you is, we have to start thinking about information in a different way. So think about a website is a very clear kind of structured information. 
the site visitor has to navigate these buckets of content in a way that you organize them. That's really different than saying, tell me about this. Well, if somebody says, tell me about this to you, you have to choose where that starting point is. You have to take them on a journey. You have to tell them a story. We're moving in that direction. So that's going to start to change how you think about the information and the stories that you have. And, um, and we're seeing that also in the rise of artificial intelligence, which is making a lot of this possible. So some of you, I have a Amazon Echo device. I talk to Alexa all the time. I love Alexa. Um, but it's all this functionality is already um, available in a sense to be able to say, Alexa, make a donation to Heartland Alliance. Uh, and you, know, you already have your payment stuff built into there. It's Amazon, so Amazon payments. Um, but, but even thinking about information, tell me a story about water, uh, you know, Alexa, tell me, tell me, um, uh, you know, what's happening in the world or what's happening uh, in development or how can I save children's lives or, you know, there, there's, mm. we're, we're moving to this natural language computing world, which we, you know, first saw in Star Trek episodes talking to the computer or something. Um, and it's here and it's happening. And it just one thing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Miriam, just the velocity of these changes is starting to move from years where we sort of watch things play out to, um, to having a change that happens within our budget cycles, right? And that's starting when, as the change accelerates, and it is accelerating, those changes are happening within our budget cycles. And that's really different than saying, I'm going to let over, you know, over five or six years, the web is playing out and maybe we're going to need a website. And then five or six years later, we need a web team. And we start to, you know, integrate this. We have a few years to kind of figure it out and get budgets together. This is part of the future is the velocity is happening so, so fast that it's going to happen within the, the, our, our things that we already have planned. And so we're going to have to be more nimble in some um, a really critical way. So I want to turn this over to Miriam just to sort of contextualize some of these changes um, that I just introduced. Awesome. I, for one, am very excited for the world to be more like Star Trek. But um, if you look at all of these technologies and sort of think about what are the principles behind them that... Um, something that we noticed here is that maybe the things that are most like what happens in real life are the ones that are rising to the top. So all of these messaging bots are really trying to mimic that one-to-one -one contact that you get in conversation. Um, the voice for human conversation, video, we've known at C3 for years, is an amazing vehicle for carrying emotion. Um, live feeds are mimicking real-time connection and virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, these kinds of tools are truly engines of empathy and to give this immersive experience that allow our audience to really feel themselves inside of these different situations. And so to succeed in digital, we actually need to be more human, which feels a little bit paradoxical. So then the question becomes, what is it that makes us human? And you might argue that it's the tools that we use, right? Fire was a good idea. The wheel and axle has been really beneficial. Um, iPhones and all of these kinds of crazy technologies that we're using today. Um, the fact that humanity uses tools is a big marker that uh, distinguishes us from the rest of the animal kingdom. Um, and it's something that definitely uh, appeals to, our, uh, to, to us as nonprofit marketing and communications folks. Um, the draw of tools and the plethora of them available to us is, um, is a really important thing that we see uh, on the rise in the world today. But at the same time, we are actually not the only ones that use tools. Um, crows in particular are some of my favorite animals that are actually super, super smart and um, use tools to, um, to get what they want in the world in much the way that, that we do. Um, so there's something else going on here, and I love this quote from Ursula Le Guin, who is our, our second science fiction writer who has made an appearance in this deck. Um, it's not actually about tools. The, uh, there have been great societies that didn't use the wheel, but there have been no societies that did not tell stories. Um, and that's an important thing. Um, this, this friendly looking gentleman here, Michael Gazaniga, um, is a neuroscientist and a teacher who has done a lot of research into the way that the different hemispheres of our brains um, collect and interpret information. And he, in his work on um, looking at people who um, have had certain brain injuries and figuring out sort of 
how does the brain talk to itself and, and interpret information from the world has really come up with this theory that, that storytelling is at the heart of who we are and how we understand ourselves in the world. Um, there's, a, there's a piece in the, in the left side of our brain called the left, the left brain interpreter, which essentially every time we interact with the world, every time we take in a piece of messaging or information or whatever it is, there's, a, there's an action that happens in our brains that helps hang that on a pre-existing story. Um, that a story that we're telling ourselves all the time about who we are and our role in the world. And so intentionally or not, we as communications professionals are storytellers because the people that we're sending our message out to are constantly telling themselves this internal story. And so what story is our messaging telling is the big question. So let's look for a minute as a, at a piece of messaging that carries a story. Um, and um, I would love for everybody to take a moment and get reacquainted with the chat because we're going to ask you to, uh, to look at this piece of messaging and tell us what story it's telling. So Brianna is armed and ready to take a look at your answers here. Um, let's get ready. So here is a powerful, perhaps familiar um, ad from Nike. Um, that's really a single image. So in the chat, would love you to take a moment to think about what is the story here? And perhaps more importantly, who is the protagonist of that story? And what we have here is an image, um, it, but it is a, there is a video uh, of this and you can um, find it later uh, on YouTube if you just uh, type in find your greatness. Um, but the image itself uh, tells essentially the whole story. Yeah. Brianna, do we have some answers coming in? Yes, we do. Um, Meg says that you, the viewer, are the protagonist. Um, e Partridge, if I say your name wrong, I'm sorry, says the kid is the protagonist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Yes, amazing insights. And um, I think you're both right <laughs> in an interesting way. Um, and part of what I think is so powerful about this is that took um, maybe a second for us to look at this image and really gather that story. Our brain processes images at a rate thousands of times higher than we do text. Um, and so that's an important message from here as well. But really what we should take away from this is that um, when our audience is on digital, that's their story. They're telling the story of themselves. And so this has huge implications for the messaging that we're putting out in the world and what it means to, um, to speak to our audiences in a way that appeals to them and spurs them to movement. So I want to shift for just a moment to a, a case story of an organization that C3 has worked with for years in um, thinking about their own story, um, and that is the Make-A-Wish Foundation, which is likely a familiar, uh, a familiar organization. Um, and so Make-A-Wish, for the past 35 or so years that they've been in existence, has relied on really a single narrative to carry all of their messaging. And that is this Wish Kids story, right? Um, which even without knowing Make-A-Wish all that well, you can probably tell this story. Um, a child with a critical illness um, has granted their one true wish, and at the end of that, there are smiles all around, everybody is happy and the world is a brighter, shinier place at the end of it, um, which is a great story for some people, but not all. And so what C3 did is we came in and we worked with them to think about, well, when you put this messaging out in the world, you may be telling one story, but what story is your audience telling themselves? And what we see here is that um, the story that Make-A-Wish is telling really positions themselves as the protagonist, as the main actor in that story. And what happens when you shift the protagonist from being the, from being the organization, and it's in kind of an interesting way, from being the wish kid, to being all of those what were formerly supporting characters in that story? What happens when you position them at the center? Um, here's an example from one of Make-A-Wish's chapters that we worked with, Make-A-Wish in Alaska, Washington, um, where they shifted their storytelling. So if you want to hit up the chat one more time and just tell us who is the protagonist in each of these examples. There's, um, there's one in the, there, there are two posts here. Um, if you want to take a shot at identifying who is the protagonist in, the, in each of these. Brianna, do we have any ideas coming in? Not yet, but let's give it one more second. Julie okay. says the donors. All right, yes, definitely in the lower left. We've got cute little Marcel, who is actually not necessarily a wish kid, but a donor to Make-A-Wish, and that's his story that they're telling. 
And Eleanor says the donors and the volunteers. The donors and the volunteers, absolutely. So we've got a great example of a corporate sponsor of Make-A-Wish talking about not just the impact on the Wish Kid, but the impact of working with Make-A-Wish on their business and on the experience of being a team together. Fantastic, we got some smart folks on this one. Yeah. Um, so really what this all comes down to is the greatest story commandment, as Andrew Stanton is teaching us here, is make me care. And in the digital world, what we do to make, make our audience care is we make it about them. And I think this also pulls together with um, a lot of those original technologies that Michael introduced to you about the, the chat bots and virtual reality and Alexa and all of these things. You look at these technologies, you look at the way they're using digital, and the shift that's happening so, so rapidly is more and more the user, the audience, the consumer is being put at the center of that story. They are the protagonist, they are the hero that we need to pay attention to. Um, and I think this is true that even as all of these technologies get smaller, as they get closer to our bodies, as they get more accessible, more and more we need to be cognizant of putting our audience and not necessarily ourselves at the center of those stories. So essentially being more human, perhaps paradoxically on digital by starting with stories that put your audience at the center changes everything. And maybe this is something that Michael can say another word or two yeah. about how we've, how we've noticed this play out. Yeah, I, and I think one of the things we've, uh, so the, an important thing is it's, things are changing, they're changing rapidly. There's so much focus on tools as we, as we talked about earlier. You can never, you'll never be able to keep up with, with, with all of it all the time. Um, and so part of getting off of that um, treadmill of uh, tools and, and, and tactics um, is, to, is to put, the things that are gonna stay the same at the center. And that's really being p powerful storytellers, being able to tell those stories in these different mediums, right, is important. Um, but the core stories matter much more than anything mm -hmm. else, you know, around those tactics. And so what w the way it changes everything is that organizations that can't get in touch with their own stories, that communications departments that are overly siloed, that can't um, access the things, the, the you, part of this in terms of who those constituents are, are really at a disadvantage. And so we have organizations structurally that are the same as they've been for 50 years in terms of how they're built, um, working in a world that's completely different on the outside. Mm -hmm. And so at C3, we've really gotten into the connection between those things and saying effective digital is really has to touch on organization, organizational operations, how you talk to each other, you know, the outside is just a reflection of the inside. And if the inside is a mess or is difficult or is siloed or is challenging, the outside is going to feel uh, not right either. Um, and so really aligning those things is something that we're doing more and more work upon. Yeah. And what happens a lot in nonprofits and um, C3 has worked with many of them and many of the staff here came from the nonprofit world. We're deeply familiar and we empathize um, that it's tough to take time to reflect on the stories that you're telling and the work that you're doing as you're being pushed ahead, as you're you know, trying to stay within your budget, as you're trying to hit outcomes for your funders. Um, and so C3 has designed a series of workshops to help you hit the pause button for a bit and consider the way that your organization is built and whether it's aligned with the demands, the principles, the values of the digital age. To think about the stories that you're telling and to think about how you can orient yourself to be really future facing and future proof your digital in a way that will be yeah. meaningful for your organization and powerful for your constituents. Yeah, and an important uh, benefit of this is to have a shared language internally. You know, we learn things, we go to conferences and we come back and we're like, hey, we gotta talk about this, and people just don't know what you're talking about. And by doing workshops, by having leadership in the room, by hearing about this, by seeing it, by seeing how it plays out in other organizations, you can start to have powerful and important conversations internally that are just mm -hmm. impossible to happen otherwise. 
but I know you all want to get started right this second. So don't worry about it. <laughs> We're going to give you a tool to help to do this um, on your own with your teams initially. Um, in early next week, we'll be releasing a white paper that will also include a sort of audit self-reflective tool. So we encourage you to check that out, to sit down with your team, and to really take the time to think through what your master narrative is, what your story is, and um, consider how that story is being hung on the pre-existing narratives happening inside of your audience's brains as you're putting messages out into the world. So, so with the, how do we do on yeah, time? Uh, we're, uh, we're pretty good, but we actually have a question. Sure. Fantastic. Yeah, since we have three minutes left. Um, Eleanor wants to know what your advice is for comms folks who are wanting to innovate but are coming up against leadership that just isn't into it. Mm. Yeah, and I think that was my point before. I think it starts with a shared language. I have been brought in so many times to organizations, to boards, to just do presentations, even, even you know, in, in an ideal world, doing a half-day workshop where you really dig in to not only what the content is, but what the organization's particular challenges are mm -hmm. and get people talking. That's ideal, and that's what we're doing. But even a lunch and learn where there's some introduction to those things um, and getting the shared stuff. So I understand the benefit of that third party. Yeah. You, they, I could come in and say exactly what you've been saying to leadership and they're <laughs> going to hear me differently uh, than they're hearing you. And that's just unfortunate and, right. uh, and a reality of organizations and how organizations function, you know, is that people get put into their boxes and, they're hurt a certain way and in, in a certain thing. So I think we see that as our goal and, you know, welcome that opportunity to just give that aha moment that enables you then to say, okay, now that we all see this, what does it mean for how we work? Mm -hmm. um, and so not making it about, we need to innovate for innovation's sake or whatever, right. but it's the, it's the metaphor of the burning platform there. You're on the oil platform in the North sea and it's on fire. And, Jeez. and that's the world that we're in though, <laughs> you know, things are changing around us and the old way is not going to continue to work forever. And right. so when they see that you have two choices, you can stay on the platform and disappear, um, or you can jump into the water and it's scary and it's dangerous. Um, but you know, that's what you have to do. And I think get, seeing that and understanding these changes and how they're affecting uh, right. the leadership, that's going to get them to then be listening and paying attention. Yeah. And Eleanor, as someone who's been in exactly your position, I have to say that the way that your leadership feels about all of this is just as important as the information that's being delivered. And there's, uh, there's something about having that aha moment where um, your, the leadership of your organization realizes that the risks of staying the same are greater than the risks of changing. And so um, whether you're on a burning oil platform or if you happen to be, my metaphor is if, if you happen to uh, think of yourself as a bird on a branch, right? And the branch is falling. Um, so instead of relying on the branch that's held you up for so long, maybe trust your own wings. All right, Brianna, any other questions? Yeah, so we have one last one from Kathy, and she just wants to know, when we say digital, do we classify that as all platforms? Um, so we're talking Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, anything else that you guys would include? I would say, oh, there's a lot that we could include. Yeah, I think it really means, um, and, and even this whole idea that there is digital and there's, <laughs> and there's these divisions, you know, we, we talk about us as a digital agency. Well, every agency better be a digital agency today because <laughs> the world in which everybody's living um, uh, has, has so much digital in it, even if the, the, uh, t the check gets written, you know, on paper. So, mm -hmm. um, so digital, when we talk about digital, we talk really about, we're really thinking about everything. We're thinking about everything from email to websites, to all the social platforms, to all the emerging platforms. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's really um, a, a whole ecosystem. And you have to say, we're, we're telling powerful stories. Maybe we can't be everywhere. We can't do everything. And we're definitely in the school of go deep, build strong communities, build a strong core, mm -hmm. make strong choices, um, and, um, and, and say no to other things so that you are able to yeah. uh, win where you're playing and only play where you can win. Yeah, and I think part of this also is reflected in the way that C3 has evolved. We started as a video shop, creating you know creating great stories that were encapsulated in in a single four or five minute video. Um, and what realized what we realized over the course of our evolution is that 
you know, that story needs to touch everything. And it's really digital that allows you to do that. So the minute that you can kind of sit down with your leadership and help them make that shift and think about the way that digital, the way that storytelling just permeates absolutely every element of your organization and how this new age really demands that, um, you're going to have a more powerful conversation and you're going to make more impact moving forward. Great. Well, thank you all for being here today. I know we did this very quick, but that, that was the <laughs> idea. Um, we'd love to collaborate with you or find those opportunities. And here's our contact information. Really yeah, feel free to just uh, drop us an email, um, call us, uh, tweet at us, uh, or, or connect in any other way, and uh, we can continue this conversation. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Uh, this is being recorded, and we will send that out shortly. Have a good one. All right.